Poison Study by Maria V. Snyder Audiobook by Sinna Chapter 23 After hiding Janko's gifts deep in my uniform pocket, I went into Valak's suite. He was working at his desk, but he looked up as soon as I entered the room, giving me the impression that he had been waiting for me. Where have you been? He asked. With Janko, I said, but I was wary. As long as I arrived at the scheduled times during the day, Valak didn't ask about what I did with my free time. Doing what? Valak demanded, standing with his hands on his hips. The comical image of a jealous husband popped into my mind. I stifled a smile, discussing fighting tactics. Oh. Valak relaxed his stance, but moved his arms awkwardly, as if he felt he had overreacted and was trying to cover it up. Well, that's all right, but from now on I need to know where you are at all times, and I suggest you to stay in the castle and keep a low profile for a while. General Brazel's guards have set a bounty on your head. A bounty? Fear pulsed through my chest. It could be a rumor or just drunken soldiers' talk, but until they leave, I want you protected. Valak's tone was firm, but then he added, I don't want to train another taster. I'll be careful. No, you'll be paranoid. You'll move in a crowd, keep to well-lit areas, and you'll make certain to have an escort with you whenever you're walking down empty hallways late at night. Understood? Yes, sir. Good. The general's brandy meeting is scheduled for tomorrow evening. Each general will bring a bottle of his finest brandy to serve as they discuss Ixian business late into the night. You will be needed to taste the commander's drinks. Valak lifted a box of eight bottles from the floor. They clinked musically as he set the carton on the table. Pulling out a small drinking glass, he said, I want you to sample each brandy once tonight and at least twice tomorrow, so you know how each tastes clean of poisons. He handed me the glass. Each bottle is labeled according to the type of brandy and which general brings it. I grabbed a decanter at random. It was General Dino's cherry brandy, made in MD-8. Pouring a mouthful, I took a sip and rolled the liquid around my tongue attempting to commit the taste to memory before swallowing. The strong alcohol burned down my throat, leaving behind a small fire in my chest. My face flushed with the heat. I suggest you use the slurp and spit method so you don't get drunk, Valak said. Good point. I found another glass for spitting, and then worked my way through the remainder of the bottles. On the day of the meeting, I tasted each brandy twice more in Valak's suite, and then tested myself with a third round. Only when I could pinpoint by taste alone which cordial belonged to which general was I satisfied. That night, I waited for Valak to escort me to the war room. He came downstairs, decked out in full dress uniform. Red braids draped his shoulders. Medals were lined up six deep over his left breast. He oozed dignity. A man of stature. I would have been impressed, except for the uncomfortable and peevish look he wore. A petulant child forced to wear his best clothes. I covered my mouth, but was unable to block my laughter. <laughs> Enough! I have to wear this damn thing once a year and as far as I'm concerned, it's one time too many. Valak tugged at his collar. Ready? I joined him at the door. The uniform enhanced his athletic body, and my thoughts drifted to how magnificent he would look with his uniform puddled around his feet. You look stunning, I blurted. Mortified, I blushed as a rush of heat spread through my body. I must have swallowed more brandy than I'd realized. Really? Phallic glanced down at his uniform. Then he set his shoulders back and stopped yanking at his collar. His cross expression changed to a thoughtful smile. Yes, you do, I said. We arrived in the commander's war room just as the generals assembled. The long, slender, stained glass windows glowed with the weak light of the setting sun. Servants scurried around the circular chamber, lighting lanterns and arranging platters of food and drink. All military personnel were attired in their dress uniforms. Medals and buttons sparkled. I knew only three generals by sight. The rest I deduced by the color of the diamonds on their otherwise black uniforms. Scrutinizing their faces, I memorized their different features in case Valak tested me later. Brazel glared when I made eye contact. Advisor Mawkin stood next to him, and I shivered as Mawkin's eyes slid over me with cunning appraisal. When Brazel and Rayad had performed their experiments on me, 
Makin had always hovered nearby. His presence, sensed but unseen, had given me violent nightmares. Brazel's usual advisors were missing. I wondered why he had brought Mogkin instead. The commander sat at the tip of the egg-shaped conference table. His uniform was simple and elegant, with real diamonds stitched onto his collar. The generals, flanked by their advisors, seated themselves around the rest of the table. Valak's chair was to the commander's right, and my stool was placed behind them, against the only stone wall in the room. I knew the meeting would last all night, and I was glad I would be able to rest my back. Another advantage to my position was that I wasn't in direct sight of Brazel. Although I could avoid seeing the poisonous looks he might flash my way, I couldn't hide from Mogkin's pointed stares. The commander pounded a wooden gavel on the table. Silence fell. Before we launch into the scheduled topics, the commander said, indicating the detailed agenda which had been distributed earlier. I have an important announcement. I have appointed a new successor. A murmur rippled through the war room as the commander walked around the table and handed a sealed envelope to each general. Inside the envelopes were eight pieces to an encoded puzzle that would reveal the new successor's name when deciphered by Valak's key. Tension permeated the room. I felt it pressing against me like an overfilled water skin about to burst. A maelstrom of expressions, surprise, anger, concern, and contemplation crossed the general's faces. General Rasmussen of MD-7 whispered into his advisor's ear, the general's cheeks turning as red as his hair and mustache. I leaned forward in my seat and saw Brazel struggle to keep his face neutral as delight tweaked his features. Instead of erupting, the tension simmered and leaked away as the commander ignored it by beginning the meeting. Items related to MD-1 were the first order of business, to be followed by each district in order. As a bottle of General Kit Vivin's special white brandy slid around the table, the generals discussed snowcats and mining rights. Come on, Kit. Enough about the cats. Just feed them up on the pack ice like we do, and they won't bother you. General Tenzo of MD2 said in exasperation, running a meaty hand through his moon-white hair. His full mane stood out starkly against his tanned skin. My interest in the proceedings waxed and waned, depending on the subject. After a while, I began to feel lightheaded and warm, as the brandy influenced my body, since protocol dictated that I swallow when tasting for the commander. The generals voted on various topics, but the commander held the final vote. Mostly he ruled in favor of the majority. No one ventured a complaint when he didn't. Commander Ambrose had lived in MD3, scratching out a meager existence with his family in the foothills of the Soul Mountains. Nestled between the mountains and the ice pack, his home was atop a vast diamond mine. When the rich find had been discovered, the king had claimed the diamonds and allowed the commander's family to live there and work in the mines. He lost many family members to cave-ins and to the damp and dirty environment. As a young man, seething at the injustices of the monarchy, Ambrose educated himself and began preaching about reform. His intelligence, bluntness, and pervasiveness gained him many loyal supporters. My mind focused back on the meeting when the generals reached issues regarding MD-5. General Brazel caused a considerable stir. Instead of sliding around his best brandy, he sent a silver tray containing what looked like small brown stones. Valak handed one to me. It was a round drop of Brazel's Criollo. Before protests about ignoring tradition could escalate, Brazel rose and invited everyone to take a bite. After a brief moment of silence, exclamations of delight filled the war room. The Criollo was filled with strawberry brandy. I gave the commander the all-clear sign so I could savor the rest of my morsel. The combination of the sweet, nutty taste of the Criollo mixed with the smooth texture of the brandy was divine. Rand would be upset that he hadn't thought of mixing the two, I supposed, then regretted feeling sorry for Rand as I envisioned his deceitful face. After the praise died down, Brazel made the announcement that the construction of his new factory was complete. Then he went on to more mundane matters of how much wool had been sheared and the expected output of the cotton plantations. Military District 5 produced and dyed all the thread for Ixia, and then sent it to General Frannis's MD3 to be woven into fabric. Frannis nodded his head in concern as he wrote down the figures Brazel quoted. He was the youngest of the generals, 
and had the habit of tracing the purple diamonds on his uniforms with a finger whenever he was concentrating. I dozed on my stool as fuzzy thoughts gathered like storm clouds in my mind. Strange dreams about brandy, border patrols, and permits swirled like snowflakes. Then the images turned bright and sharp as a picture of a young woman dressed in white hunting furs snapped into my mind. She held a bloody spear high in the air in celebration. A dead snowcat lay at her feet. She slammed the tip of her weapon into the pack ice and drew a knife. Cutting a slash in the cat's fur, she used a cup to collect the blood that spilled out. She exulted as she drank, scarlet rivulets spilling down her chin. I heard her thoughts clearly in my mind. No one has managed this feat, she thought. No one but I, she shouted over the snow. Her exhilaration filled my heart. Prove that I'm a strong, cunning hunter. Proof that my manhood was taken from me. Proof that I'm a man. Men will not rule me any longer, she cried. Become the snowcat to live with snowcats. Become a man to live with men. The hunter turned her face. At first, I took her to be the commander's sister. They shared the same thin, delicate features and black hair. She wore power and confidence like a cloak. Peering at my dreaming self, her gold almond-shaped eyes drove through me like a lightning strike. Sudden recognition that she was the commander jerked me awake. My heart pounded and my head thumped, and I realized I was staring directly into Mogkin's searing gaze. He smiled with satisfaction. The commander's reason for hating magicians was as clear to me as glass. He was a she, but with the utter conviction that she should have been born a man. That cruel fate had chosen to burden him with a mutation that he had to overcome. And the commander feared that a magician might pull the secret from his mind. Pure foolishness, I thought, shaking my head to dismiss the whole crazy notion. Just because I had dreamed about a woman didn't mean that the commander was one. It was absolute nonsense. Or was it? Rubbing my eyes, I glanced around to see if anyone else had noticed that I had fallen asleep. The commander stared off into the distance, and Valak sat, stiff and alert, scanning the room, seeking something or someone. General Tesso had the floor. Valak pulled his gaze back to the commander and bumped his arm in alarm. What's going on? Where were you? He whispered urgently. Ah, <sighs> just remembering a time long ago, the commander said in a wistful voice. More enjoyable than listening to General Tesso's excruciatingly detailed report on a corn harvest in MD4. I studied the commander's features, trying to superimpose the woman from my dream. They matched, but that meant nothing. Dreams twisted reality, and it was easy to envision the commander killing a snowcat. The rest of the meeting continued without incident, and I dozed on my stool from time to time, untroubled by strange dreams. When the commander pounded his gavel, I was awake in an instant. Last item, gentlemen, the commander announced. A Cetian delegation has requested a meeting. The room erupted with voices. Arguments sprang to life, as if the generals were picking up an old debate right where they had left off. They discussed trade treaties and quarreled about attacking Sidia. Instead of trading for goods, why not take them, they argued. They wanted to expand their districts and gain more men and resources, ceasing all worries about Sidia attempting to attack Ixia. The commander sat in silence and let the flow of advice wash over him. The generals settled enough to proclaim their beliefs about allowing the Sidians to come. The four northern generals, Kit Viven, Chenzo, Franis, and Dino, didn't want to meet with the delegation, while the four southern generals, Tesso, Rasmussen, Hazel, and Brazel, favored a summit with the Sidians. The commander shook his head. I acknowledge your opinions about Sitia, but the Southerners would rather trade with us than attack us. We have more men and metal, a fact they're all well aware of. To attack Sitia, we would expend many lives and large sums of money. And for what? Their luxury items aren't worth the cost. I'm content with Ixia. We have cured the land of the king's disease. Perhaps my successor will want more. We'll have to wait until then. A murmur rippled through the generals. Brazel nodded in agreement, with his thin lips anchored in a predator's smile. 
I have already agreed to meet with the southern contingent, the commander continued. They're due to arrive in four days. You have until then to express your specific concerns to me before departing for your home districts. Meeting adjourned. The bang from the commander's gavel echoed throughout the dead, silent room. The commander rose, and with his bodyguards and Valak close behind, he prepared to leave. Valak gestured for me to join them. I lurched to my feet. The full effect of the brandy I had consumed washed over me. Giddy, I followed the others from the room. An explosion of sound slipped through the door just before it closed behind us. That should stir things up a bit, the commander said with a wan smile. I would advise against the vacation in MD-8 this year, Valak said sarcastically. The way Dino reacted to your announcement about the Sounder delegation, I would expect him to pepper your Pete's house with sand biters. Valak shivered. A horribly painful way to die. My skin crawled too, thinking of the lethal spiders the size of small dogs. Our procession continued in silence for a while as we headed back to the commander's suite. My gait was unsteady. The stone walls blurred past me, as if they were moving, and I was the one standing still. Outside the commander's suite, Valak said, I'd watch out for Rasmussen too. He didn't take the news of the change in your successor well. The commander opened his door. I stole a quick glance inside his suite. The same plain, utilitarian style that decorated his office and the rest of the castle was present. What had I expected? Maybe a splash of color or something a bit more feminine? I gave my head a little shake to banish such absurd thoughts. The motion made my head spin, and I had to put a hand to the wall to keep myself from stumbling. I watch out for everyone, Wellick. You know that, the commander said, before shutting the door behind him. Upon entering our suite, Valak stripped off his uniform jacket and threw it on the couch. He pointed to a chair and said, Sit, we need to talk. I plopped into the chair and dangled a leg over the armrest, watching Valak pace the room in his sleeveless undershirt and form-fitting black pants. Imagining my hands helping to ease the tension in the long, ropey muscles of his arms almost started a giggling fit. Brandy flowed through my blood, quickening my pulse. Two things were very wrong tonight, Valak said. <laughs> oh, come on. I just dozed for a minute, I said in my defense. Valak shot me a quizzical look. No, 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 you did fine. I meant about the meeting, the generals. He continued to pace. First, Brazel seemed unusually happy about the change in successor and the city and delegation. He's always wanted a trade treaty, but he typically exercises a more cautious approach. And second, there was a Mattison in the room. What? My breath locked. Had I been discovered? Matzik, very subtle, from a trained professional. I only felt it once, a brief touch, but I couldn't pinpoint the source. But the Matzik had to be in the room, or I wouldn't have felt it. When? During Tessa's long-winded dissertation about corn. Valak's posture had relaxed a little, as if the act of talking about a problem helped him deal with it. About the same time your snoring could be heard halfway across the room. Ha! I said rather loud. You were so stiff at that meeting, I thought rigor mortis had set in. Valak snorted with amusement. <laughs> I doubt you could have looked any better sitting in that uncomfortable dress uniform all night. I imagine Dylan sprayed on extra strats with malice's glee. Then he grew serious again. Do no advisor Mokan. He eyed you most of the evening. <sighs> I know of him. He was Rayad's primary advisor. They also hunted together. What's he like? <laughs> Same kind of vermin as Rayetta and Nix, I said. The words poured off my lips. I slapped both hands over my mouth, but it was too late. Valak studied me for a moment. Then he said, There were a number of new advisors at the meeting. I guess I'll have to check them out one by one. It seems we have a new southern spy with magic abilities. He sighed. <sighs> it never ends. He dropped onto the edge of the couch as weariness settled on him like a coating of dust. <laughs> if it did, he'd be out of a job. Before I could stop myself, I squeezed behind Valak and started to massage his shoulders. The alcohol had taken complete command of my movements, and the tiny sober section of my brain could do nothing but yell useless admonishments. <laughs>